Oh, no, I'm going to ruin who killed JFK for you right now. Ready? I think I lost your video real quick. Um, you did? It says, uh, Brad Meltzer's video has been disabled due to internet quality issues. See, I told you this new technology was going to screw <laughs> it's us. It's not our fault. By the way, I just was going to reveal who killed JFK, and, and, and the it, video that's goes the off. System. It was so clear that the government's taping us right now, and it's not whatever crappy equipment we're on. Welcome to Getting Grilled. I'm Jordan Stratton, and today we're serving up Brad Meltzer. He's a novelist, TV show creator, and comic book author. And today he's here to talk about his newest book, The 10 Greatest Conspiracies of All Time. Now you might be thinking, but Jordan, why would I want to know about past conspiracies when I have to deal with all these new ones in the news seemingly every day now? And to that I would say, you're right. We live in very uncertain and concerning times. And Brad is probably one of the most qualified people to talk about that too. So let's get grilling. You are here to talk about your new book. This is uh, ten, The Ten Greatest Conspiracies of All Time. You've kind of made a career out of being a skeptic, right? Yeah, you know, when we first did, the, the book is based on a TV show I used to do on the History Channel. It was called Brad Meltzer's Decoded, which was my right. favorite title of all time. Brad Meltzer's Decoded. I was like, I said to my wife, honey, what are we having for Brad Meltzer's dinner tonight? Because yesterday we had Brad Meltzer's chicken. Tonight I'd like to have Brad Meltzer's pasta. And she was like, you can go sleep on Brad Meltzer's couch. There we go. That's the right answer. I like that. It only really works if you're the one saying it, though. Can I, you go to Starbucks be like, I would like Brad Meltzer's Americano? You can try it there. It, yes, it will not work as well. And nor does it work in your own house either. Third person, will, you, truly third person never works for anybody. Nobody. Like maybe Muhammad Ali and that's it. So we did this show Decoded. And years ago, the way we started the show, I got a phone call from the family uh, of John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth famously, of course, shot Abraham Lincoln. 12 days later, every history book will tell you that Abraham Lincoln's killer, John Wilkes Booth, was shot dead after he killed Lincoln. I got contacted by the lawyer for John Wilkes Booth's family. They said, we got the family from John Wilkes Booth here. Their family is the, their relative is the one who killed Abraham Lincoln. And um, they have proof that every history book is wrong. He did not die 12 days after shooting Abraham Lincoln. Their relative actually escaped. They got the wrong guy. They have the evidence. And Brad, do you want to hear that story? Yes, I want yeah, to hear sure. that story. Like, put the call <laughs> through, right? I mean, you take that phone call. And basically, the History Channel said to me, do you want to do a show where we kind of go through history and figure these things out? And for two seasons of television, they let me just go out. And sometimes I think the reason people like to code it as a show is we didn't go out there and fear monger and say, the government's trying to murder you and the Freemasons are trying to steal your baby and they're stealing your car and everything else in the world. But we ask the actual hard questions and the ones that should be asked. I mean, we all have in our phones the Library of Congress in our pocket that we walk around with, the Library of Alexandria in our pocket that we walk around with. But the hardest thing to find today is the truth. Finding the truth and why would someone hide it and, and trying to figure out really the psychology behind these things, which can oftentimes be way more fascinating than just some kind of fear-mongering story. It is all about fear because that's what conspiracies are. They're mirrors and you hold them up and you reveal yourself. They reveal you. You tell me your favorite conspiracy and I'll tell you who you are. If you look at who killed JFK, I was saying that, you know, it's always a mirror. It's always your fears. So if you look in the 60s, who did we think killed JFK? You know, it was the height of the Cold War. So we thought it was the Russians that did it. We thought it was the Cubans that did it. It was all our enemies at the height of the Cold War. In the 70s, who killed JFK? Watergate was hitting. So we started distrust in our own government. So who killed JFK? CIA. LBJ was in it. The CIA did it, right? It was our own government did it, it was inside job. And the 80s, as Godfather movies peak, who kills JFK? It was the mafia, the mobsters did it. And if you wanna know who killed JFK, it's decade by decade, whoever America is most afraid of at that moment in time. And that's what all conspiracies are. They reveal your fears. I feel like our minds instantly go to the thing that we fear the most because that's what we're always trying to protect ourselves from. I mean, you look at this year, I mean, it's pretty, we've seen so many unprecedented events happening between this pandemic and we were looking at this incredibly divisive presidential election and nationwide protests and riots. When you look at conspiracies in general, um, that one of the things that they do is they're also a reassurance to us, right? Because the idea, that anything can go wrong on any given day or that the government's gonna come and get you is a terrifying thought. You know what, the only thing that's more scary than that? That none of this matters. That it's all just happenstance, that there's no excuse behind anything, it's all just random atoms plowing back together. So if we can blame it on that one person or that government that's doing it, or this guy that's trying to screw us over, the world makes a little more sense. If we can blame it on lots of people who killed JFK, 
the world makes a lot more sense than the most terrifying idea is that one person with a gun can go out there and destabilize the entire world. That's a terrifying thought. I mean, now we've got these giant social media companies that can that can tailor all of the things that we see online. So we, we kind of live in these bubbles now, whether it's due to your political party or your religion or your social circle, whatever it looks like. The idea that the world is not actually like this bubble that you're used to seeing is terrifying. It's no surprise that so many people believe that something bigger has to be happening because what I'm seeing is not being reflected in what's happening. That's exactly right. We used to have different views when we were little. You grow up and, you know, if you like sports and another kid didn't like sports, you, you had to deal with that kid. I liked comic books growing up. I was like one of two kids that liked comic books in the whole school. I, now, I can find a million people like comic books. So we can all find people just like us. The negative of it is we don't put up with any views that are different than our own anymore. We're losing that muscle and it's a terrible thing. It's terrible for our kids too. I work really hard to help my kids, you know, and realize like, it doesn't have to just be your way. When Benjamin Franklin uh, was, he was obviously founded newspapers and he said he wanted to always run not just his own ideas in them, but the opposite side's ideas. He said that if you just put out in the universe, uh, if you just read stuff that agrees with you, you're not an informed citizen. And I think he's entirely right. Now, speaking of your kids, living in this world that we, we've been talking about that's, that's now full of skeptics, how do you teach them to be healthy skeptics, to, to think critically, to look at things from different points of view, to help understand other points of view with empathy. For me personally, I'm a writer. Um, so I had to do it the hard way. I had to write books for them. So we started literally a whole line of children's books. I was tired of my kids looking at reality TV show stars and people who are famous for being famous and thinking that's a hero. And I told my daughter, it was funny, I said to her, Amelia Earhart's this amazing woman. She flew across the Atlantic Ocean. Isn't that incredible? And my daughter said, big deal, dad. Everyone flies across the Atlantic Ocean. And she's not wrong. <laughs> she, and she's not wrong. And then I told her this true story that when Amelia Earhart was seven years old, and this is true, she built a homemade roller coaster in her backyard. She took a wooden crate, she put roller skating wheels on the bottom, she shoved it to the roof of her tool shed, put big giant wooden things here, came flying down the side, flew through the air, crashes, and then gets up and yells, that was amazing, or whatever she yells. Um, my daughter's like, that's a good story. And suddenly I realized that was it, is not just to tell them stories of when they're famous, but tell them when they're little kids. You know, we make a huge mistake with our heroes today. What we do is we build these monuments to them. We chisel them out of granite and concrete. We build these monuments, and then we expect our kids and us to worship at their feet. And we do heroes a huge disservice because we forget in that moment that they're real people. And anyone you look up to, whether it's Rosa Parks or Dr. King or Anne Frank or anyone else, they all had moments where they were scared and they were terrified and they didn't know they could go on. And the, the, something that is, I'm seeing just kind of a through line between this book series and even this conspiracy series, it's all just a search for truth. It's a search for um, understanding. It's, it's making things make sense, making it all relatable. That's exactly right. I mean, one of the things that we feel like right now, we're in, we're in an age of anxiety. Whatever side you're on, no politics about it, you're anxious right now and it makes you feel really alone. And I think for me, what was important is the more I can make kids out there realize you're not alone. I'm not teaching them that these, these heroes are better than them or, or these aspirations they'll never have, but remind them that they're not alone in the universe, that we're all the same. And when you give your kids that, that's to me one of the best gifts you can give. Yeah. All right, um, so we're just gonna wrap up here as we always do with a little grill talk. What's the First thing that comes to mind when you think of the best thing from a grill? So, I mean, I listen, I can, tell, I can tell you a steak and I can tell you a chicken and all that. But here's my thing that someone bought us. It's like a wok. It's a metal wok with holes in it. But it's the thing that you can put all your vegetables into at one time. So you can put it in your grill and then you can just close the grill. And it. I love this freaking thing. But it lets you spray and you can oil and you know, and you can just like mix it up as opposed to like using the clip, clip, clips and having yeah. them one by one do each vegetable strip by strip. So I like that, that's my favorite. I love it. Well, this is the first response we've gotten that's a vegetable forward response and I appreciate it personally. Well, I, I only because I know you've gotten the others. I mean, if, I'm gonna, if, I, if you said this is the first interview ever, I'm gonna be like, I'm grabbing steak. But I know it's not and, you, and your viewers need to know, you know, get a, a little variety. Brad, thank you so much. I think this has been a really fun episode. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Jordan. Really great to be here. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.